Good morning. Happy Sabbath once again. It's a beautiful Sabbath day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, every day, every not every day, but every Sabbath. Day every is Sabbath day. is a good Sabbath. You bet. You bet. It's a wonderful day. God's day he made just for us to spend time with him. Well, and we've been called according to our mission. Well, God's called to mission. Yes. Yes. So, as we get going with our call, let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this beautiful Sabbath morning with grateful hearts full of praise. Lord, I would pray now that the Holy Spirit will descend upon us in a powerful way as we look into more depth into what your call is to mission and what part we play in it. Lord, open our minds and hearts to the call, I pray, that we may fulfill your mission in a much more rapid pace to hasten your soon second coming of Jesus. These things I ask in his powerful name. Amen. Amen. Well, the memory text is a good one. It's a follow-up kind of on Go ye unto all the nations, making disciples. But it's a bit more specific this time. Acts 1-8. And of course, this is Acts of the Apostles. As a kid, I always thought it was A-X. It's like, why do they have axes? As opposed to the things the Apostles oh did. Acts of the Apostles. But in any case... Go right ahead, dear. <laughs> but you shall... Be- so... <laughs> <laughs> but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I find it very important, or very interesting and important, that in this directive and Sumeria, and we know how the Jews felt about the Samaritans, well, and they were all the earth. Heathens. No, well, they were cousins in I reality. Know, but they but were... They just worship in the wrong place. But anyway. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. Very specific direction of, of how to do the mission. Of how to not do the mission, but what God's mission is. And he still wants us to reach out. Yeah. God's still calling us to reach out to people so, around us. Acts 1, it talks about Jesus began to do and teach. And then in verse 2... Until the day when he was taken up after he had given commandment through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And remember last week we talked about how he breathed on them. And again, always the Spirit is associated with breath. Well, because of the translation of the word breath yeah. and Spirit. Yeah. And he had given the commandment through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Then he presented himself alive after his passion by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days, speaking of the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, um, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. John baptized with water before many days. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And often... As I was thinking about this this week, I think often we want to tell God when we are ready. You know, I'm ready, I have studied, I have done, I have been, and he's like, you know, wait. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you will know and you will not be stopped. And I, I think it's kind of interesting to look at uh, Jesus do and and teach. Well, and what's very important here is in the introduction of Jesus' last few days here on earth, verse 3 says that there were a series of many convincing demonstrations, unquestionable evidence, and infallible proofs for 40 days. Yeah. And secular historians also recorded his appearance after his crucifixion. Yeah. And there was no doubt he was dead. I mean, that's why the soldier stuck the spear in his side. Because men didn't die in a few hours of crucifixion. That was unheard of. Well, but they knew he was close to dead anyway, but that... That was certainly one one intention. So when we when we experience the power of the Holy Spirit, um, that is what 
um, Jesus had told them, just wait. When you get the Holy Spirit, when God sends that the power of the Holy Spirit, you will have to move. Well, and as Acts records later, which we will just tell you this week, that um, it was like a rushing wind. It wasn't just some little thing, and they saw tongues of fire above each of them as well. And then amazing things happened. But, you know, the fact that God reaches, uh, he directs us in Jerusalem, all Judea, and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. There is a specific direction to go and a pattern to follow. We first deal with those close at home, so to speak, and then to spread out, to move forward. And really... There was an impetus put on the early church, and even then again at the Reformation and into the time of the part after the Reformation when the established Christian church was trying to regain control, that persecution came about and even spread the gospel further because the people who were trying to flee from the persecution took the gospel message with them to many parts around the world to great distances that travelers didn't make in the early days um, yeah. because of the dangers and distances involved. So the first um, Sunday's lesson talks about getting out beyond our comfort zone. But part of the way they present this is the story of Babel, Babel, whatever you want to call it. Um, as we look at this story, they said... Um, Come, let us make bricks, burn them thoroughly. And um, as they began to build their city and their tower, um, if you go to early Sumerian writing, um, you will see record of this actual tower that they had built that was one of the great wonders of the earth, of course. And um, the intention was... Um, not just to reach the heavens, but that we can outdo God in what his destruction might be. And, and that's a, an implied uh, inference. It doesn't come right out and say that, but it does in Genesis 11, 4, say that they want to make a name for themselves. I think that's how it reads there, doesn't it? That they will build a tower so that we will make a name for ourselves. Yeah, It well, okay, <laughs> so verse 6 says... Uh, the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have um, it's before th- all six. one lang- language. Look at verse um, 4. Okay, I'll go back to 4. Thank you. Come, let us build ourselves a city. That's what Keep I have. Keep going. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest there we be go. scattered abroad in the face of the whole earth. And that's exactly what happened. They were scattered abroad. It's kind of like we have our plans, and they don't include you, God, but he had his plans, too for spreading that out, spreading out the message. Were there faithful followers? Were there some of God's people? Were there still some children of God in that group? Probably, because God always has had his people, always a remnant group, sometimes as small as eight, who are faithful to him. And that spread them out around what was available for them to get to, whether it be Pangea or what else. All right, so... I want to go back to verse 6. Behold, they are one um, people, and they will have one language. This is the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. So where are they? They're in heaven having this conversation about the people of earth. Come, let us go down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore the name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. And so we know that Shem, Ham, and Ham and Japheth were were spread um, one to Africa, one to the east, and then of course those that stayed in that area and moved into um, what we know as Europe today. But at the time, it was it was the 
the uh, Southwest Asia and into what we know as Europe. And when we look at that area and we think about um, what it was, it's kind of interesting because it wasn't just a geographical, I mean, it wasn't just a, a verbal split. It was truly um, almost as if the others had driven them out by language to a new place. We know that if we look at the time period, this is not very many generations from, um, from Adam. You know, when you go from Adam to Noah, I think Noah was Adam's great 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 grandson. Yeah, it's it's they 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 could have been alive at the same yeah. time. The the lifespan was so long, and they had not lost a tremendous amount of brain power no, and no. skill and and all of that that was afforded them at creation. In fact, if you look at the. Um, not chronology, but the genealogy, I think you can calculate the flood to be within the first 1,500 years after yes. creation. And Adam lived 960 of those yeah. poss possible 1,500 years, and that'd be a, a stretch of length. It's closer, I think, if I remember correctly, I just read it recently in a document my father actually prepared. It was less than 1,200, maybe even less than 1,100 years. So... Adam could have died just 50 to 100 years before the flood. And so he might have seen the ark being built. Well, and. <laughs> um, when okay, we, I won't do that anymore, honey. Thank you. Um, but when we look at this, the intention was to stay in the same place. The intention was that I will not be moved. This is my comfort. This is where I like. We're settling in here. We know this area. We have the control. And how easy is that for us to do the same thing? And you, it also was, we're afraid it'll, the flood will happen again. They were saying, we can't trust you, God. Your promise of the rainbow, mm, that's pretty flimsy. We're not so sure. We're afraid. So we're going to do this, stay together, and build that big tower in case the flood ever happens again. So they were kind of thumbing their nose to God. Well... Okay, I guess you could say that. Um, well, after I just the did. after the flood, um, the command to the three sons go, yes, be fruitful, multiply, and the intention was that again, um, the population would be spread out, but they were over our dead body. You know, we are going to be here. We're going to stay here, and you can't make us go, and. I was thinking about how often we in our lives are kind of that way. Well, and I'm kind well, of that sure, way I like because my group of friends. Why? 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 Well, why? I'm thinking more about. Uh, please, God, don't ever ask me to go where there's snakes. I will preach on a well, ship. You know, dude, I will preach. We did. On we went to Newberry, and God yeah. answered your prayer. He did. When we moved to Newberry. The Newberry Academy grounds are and were famous for rattlesnakes because it's right there in rattlesnake country. Yeah. And Tracy's prayer, she said all the way out was, "Lord, please no snakes, please no snakes, please no snakes." Because my good friend Cherry Venduras had told me, "Oh, when we lived there, we always had snakes." And I was like, "No." And so, in our house. We never saw snakes at all, but as soon as we moved out within a week, the new tenant had them on, had, the, front had them on the front porch. Supposedly one wrapped around her doorknob, even. So I am so, so thankful. God does amazing things that, for us, dear. Yeah, that when we go places and we're asked to go places, God is is saying, trust me, I've, I've got this plan. But very often, we have our plans. And that's of, our comfort zone. Well, I, it, like, I like it here. I want to stay here, God. It also could be that, well, I built this program. I have this wonderful ministry. I can't go anywhere else because the ministry works here, and this is what I'm doing. And it'll fall apart if I leave. Yes, because we all know that we're indispensable. Indubitably. Monday, becoming a blessing to the whole world. I read this. And that, of course, is what the the dis distribution or the disbursement of the people at the Tower of Babel began to do. But this begins, goes, jumps 
ahead quite a bit to Abraham, or Abram, I should say, rather. Yeah. And back to the Fertile Crescent area of the world. Yes. Which is kind of where Babylon was, too, but this is not in Babylon that specific was north area. And yes, east. but. Right, we're looking at the Ur of Cal. Ur. Ur, not Ur. The land of. But Ur, Ur of Chaldees. Okay, so if you imagine the Middle East, just if you didn't have any. Um, Geographic bearing. Uh, geographic bearing. And you could go from the Persian Gulf, which is where the the Tigris and Euphrates enter into the sea, and then you go up the two rivers, they kind of align, and go further west and north. Ur is down near the base. So clear over near to... Near the Persian Gulf? Near the Persian Gulf. And then, but not a sea city. He not had, a coastal city. Well, but the river. So it was. It was so close. It's not enough. on the on the beach. No. Okay. No, no. But it was on the shores of the river, which was just as good. Sure, because big river, good transport right on down. That's right. Mm-hmm. And so his movement of his family, um, there may have been some by water, but his flocks and all his people and whatever had to go along the river. Now that wouldn't be so bad. But once they reached the top, then they had to cut across beyond Babylon, north of Babylon, and head across to Canaan. Now, as I was reading this and looking at that area, it became very clear to me that, you know, we go from Abram, which was his young person name (laughs) when he is in his country, and um, God wanted to be able to say... I am taking... Now, this is the other thing. In all of that area, remember, there were no Hebrew children. There were no Israelites. There were no... Yet. Because Hebrew means journeyer. Exactly. And so when we look at the story of Abraham, Abraham has a relationship with God. His father had a relationship with God. Though he made idols. So he made idols, which is kind of funky, but anyway, um, we won't go there. But it's interesting, when God calls Abram, he heads off. And it wasn't just like, I can pack a few bags and away we go, and get in the station wagon, off we go. (laughs) It was, you know, we're moving whole crowds and herds of people and animals. Maybe... 500... 10 or 12 on a good day and on most days not even that far Um, 10 or 12 what? miles well thank you dear and just how slowly that journey well and think about this though too it wasn't just adults there were there were children and you know how fast do kids move well and that's why I wonder sometimes I'm going to watch the video when I get to heaven but um (laughs) I think some of his people it's may that, have... It's a hologram, dear. Not, I know. It'll be a hologram. Hologram. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but some may have gone along the river on boats. You know, we don't know. But we do know that they journeyed. Now, through this area, um, because of Abram and the family business, they would be well known along the trading route. But as you go through, you know, um, and and go through and get further away... They are heading into territory that is not really well known. To them. To them. And to go to a place that you don't know. And and just go, I'll send you there. Don't worry where you're headed. Yeah. I've done that a couple times, and it's terrifying. It is terrifying to go to a place that you don't know a soul, and you're not sure what your mission is, and... You just know that you're going. And it's not that God doesn't have anything for you to do, but the fact that you aren't in control of that, that God is helping determine what you will do in the land. And so, um, again, the promise has been made that you will be have children, generations, that, as many as the stars. You will be a blessing to the entire world. Well, that is the next thing that I want to look at. What does it mean to be a blessing to the world? 
to the whole. Does that mean people are happy to do business with you? Does that mean when you're sitting and having a conversation with them that they feel comfortable and they feel loved and safe? What does it mean to be called to go to these places? Well, we know in Hebrews 9, um, they're looking at, uh, I mean, 11, 9, we know that we always do the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And again, it's that idea that there's a continual legacy here that we are carrying on and that the promise is that we will be a part of that. So I was looking at, at um, Genesis uh, 12, 1 through 3, and, you know, it says, um, you know, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. And his so, father went with Noah, uh, Noah with Abraham as well. Uh, he didn't live a long time after their departure, but... but but uh, Haran, Tara, Tara, did go with Abraham, Abram uh, on the journey, and so did his nephew. You know, people, scholars say that it could be as many as five hundred people leaving Ur of Chaldees. So it was not just you know, like she said, pack up your bags into the station wagon and drive away. It was quite a. Uh, Quite, an Quite a journey. Now, what's what I find interesting as we go through the text, and they list out a bunch of different texts um, that you can go to. What does it mean um, that we look at the covenant that God promises? We know, you know, there's a covenant that's made for Adam and Eve. There's a covenant um, made for Noah. Uh, for Noah. There's a covenant made for, and you can go all the way through these, and that covenant keeps coming up. And all of it points to Jesus. All of it is about um, receiving the inheritance of um, what was promised. But the blessing, being a blessing to the whole world. Wow. I, I think there are days that it is a challenge. To be a blessing, because to your little community, let alone the whole world, hmm, dear. Well, and what does it mean to the whole world? Well, but but there again, what happened from Abram over a millennia or two is where he has blessed the whole world because he was faithful. He was faithful to the calling to which God gave him. Pack your bags up. Head out. I'll show you where to go. Just, you know, go. Don't worry about it. I'll be sure you get there. And then the inheritance that would come. The inheritance, as we've studied in, in the past few quarters, is being an heir, just like Jesus, God the Son, is heir to God, the Father. And all the heavenly blessings and responsibilities and so forth. So, yes... There have he has been a blessing to all the world because through Christ, through Christianity, through that de- development and direction of the now the church, and I don't mean the church, I mean the church, God's Jesus's spiritual body and the functioning of it here on earth. The whole world has been blessed and is blessed. Um, like Hebrews 8 says, you know, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive an inheritance. And like the Monday's lesson ends, and he went out not knowing where to go. What an example to us. If we're called like Abraham, there is our example. And Abraham, in following God's calling, received temporal blessings here on earth as well as being as well as having heavenly blessings. Yeah. And so truly they, being the spiritual father of it, what ended up to be Christianity because he was in Christ's lineage. Yeah. When we look at the idea of what Abraham um, would become, we can say, wow, he was really amazing. But there were so many times that he doubted God. Now, I was thinking about if I had taken my whole family and we had to walk. Let's say we walked, I don't know, 
let's say we walked to Phoenix, Arizona. I don't know. I'm just saying. Because I don't want to climb a lot of big hills, but there's some that way that we have to go over. But anyway, let's say we walk to Phoenix, Arizona. And I get to Phoenix, That'd Arizona. That'd be winter. Yeah. I, we get to Phoenix, Arizona, and it's like... They had 100 oh, degree temperatures there this week, you know. I know. We, we've had a famine. <laughs> we've had a famine in our land, and they find out, they get there, and the Canaanites... Or mean, well, the Canaan, wicked, the Canaanites were, were never people. nice people from the historical record that we no. have. Even secular records, the Canaanites were not nice people. They had been well entrenched in in Canaan in debauchery led by what's left to man when he's left to himself and doesn't have God at the center. Well. Anyway, but more than that, I was thinking, God has promised him a land of milk and honey, and he gets there, and they're wicked, horrible people. To say nothing of, oh, and sorry about that, there's drought. Well, and a famine so bad that they kind of continued back away and went back down south again to Egypt. Okay, I want to go there for just a second. To Egypt? I don't want to no, go there. No, uh, in the story. Oh. Abram goes to Egypt because that's where God sends him. And he follows that directive. God says, I will bless you. Um, Don't worry. I've got you taken care of. You can get food here. It will be where you were to go. When he gets there, He starts doubting God. And if you um, look at the the section um, from Genesis 12 to 13, 1, it's amazing. He makes mistake after mistake after mistake. Wow, I don't want him to kill me. So I'm going to, instead of saying um, Sarai, Sarai, or whatever her name is, is my wife... I'm going to call her my sister. And um, the pharaoh in Egypt is, you know, quite taken with her beauty. And says, I want to make you my wife. But in the end, that is prevented not by Abraham standing up and going, hey, I, I, I should have said She's my wife. Because that wouldn't have stopped them in Egypt if they wanted. Um, That was never the point there. But um, it did settle several issues in the family that um, were going to be in in worse shape. If you go to 13... 13 um, what? No, go to 17. um, Genesis 12, 17... Um, Don't you want to back up before that a bit? Well, I guess you could. Um, But when they get there, Abraham entered Egypt, and the Egyptians saw that the woman was beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And that woman was taken into Pharaoh's house, and for her sake dealt with dealt well with Abraham, and he had sheep, oxen, he asses, and men, servants, and maid servants, and she asses, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. So Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What has he done to me? Why did you not tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that he took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and be gone. Pharaoh gave them in orders concerning him, and they sent him on his way with his wife and all that he had. So Abraham has to leave Egypt. Now, I want to do a little contrast here right now. Abraham went willingly to Egypt. Well, he went willing, but willingly he blew because he was it, journeying. But he blew it as an example of God. And on a mission from God. He blew it. In contrast, Joseph didn't want to go to Egypt. 
was taken in slavery, worked in slavery, but honored God. And I was thinking about how we look at mission and how sometimes when we go willingly, we're trying to figure out how to move and maneuver to be the best. And yet for Joseph, it was, I will honor him, even in the lowest position. I will, I will work, I will honor God in all that I do and say. When we serve God, God is not asking for us to do anything or to um, determine who we'll interact with and how that will turn out. He just says, go and serve. And to me, in this part of the lesson, I, I thought, you know, two lessons. One, God loves us. Oh, sure. And he puts up with us even when we're not very bright. When we're people. Yes, when we are not the sharpest tool in the shed. We are, you know. Well, you know, Abram's statement that Sarah was his sister is partially right because she was his half-sister. So he wasn't totally lying, but you know what they say, a partially false statement's 100% false in two and false mm-hmm. tests or questions. That's right. So the fact is that, you know, Abram went there because of the horrible conditions and he made them worse and got kicked out of Egypt where, where like you mentioned, Joseph didn't want to go there, but he made, because he followed God, a success for himself and wasn't kicked out, but was highly revered and honored in Egypt. And could bring And his children. family then came and they got the best land. And despite the fact that they were made slaves, they still kept the best land. Did you ever figure that out? It was kind of bizarre. Why didn't Pharaoh say, you can't have that land. That's the best land you're out there. You're slaves. You're going to be down in the Nile Desert. You're going to walk 10 miles each day in the sand, both ways, uphill. You're slaves. They wow. kept them in the land of Goshen. Yeah. But you know, that's a very point to be taken very well. Um, when we go on our own volition, thinking we're doing God's work, sometimes we're not. And mission work is never easy. But Abraham, despite the errors... Um, went differently, chose to, I don't want to say make up for, but kind of like said, okay, Lord, you know what? I've messed up on my own. I'm going to follow you. Mm -hmm. And the early church, which is Wednesday's lesson and comfort zones, you know, (laughs) it jumps back to kind of what we talked about at the beginning of the lesson where the first mission was at home in Jerusalem. They were to witness. They were to be witnesses of Jesus in Jerusalem. Well, Jesus had just been there for three, three and a half years or so, and yet they still needed to continue. They needed to continue his work because he had just started a foothold in that point of time, and they needed to continue in Jerusalem to establish the missionary work. Yeah. So Acts eight. And we're going to be looking at verse 1 through 4. So the work was spreading because Saul is going out to uh, put a stop to it because it was a threat to the established religious rule of the time. So this 8 starts with the stoning of Stephen, where Stephen... um, has knelt down and says receive my spirit and Lord do not hold this sin against them when he had said this he fell asleep and Saul was consenting to his death in other words you know it was okayed by um, Saul on that day a great persecution arose from the church of Jerusalem and they were scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria except the apostles devout men buried um, Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house, and he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Where are you reading, Tracy? Acts 8. Verses? Start with 1. 
Uh, somehow I... All right, I had jumped beyond Stephen's death already. I was trying to find okay. my place in 14. And so when we get to <laughs> verse 4, and know that now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And then, of course, it does Philip in the ministry of Philip in Samaria, and um, then keeps going on um, to some of the other churches. But as we look at this, many times under duress or persecution, the people of God are forced to go to someplace new. I was thinking that in, that sounds terrible, but in my career as a teacher, there have been times where uh, I couldn't stay at a particular place. I had to move on. And I learned that early on in my teaching. Um, you know, people who were attempting to be divisive and and pull um, God's church apart. And it was just better for me to move on than to stay there and um, be in the middle of the fight that was not my fight. And so I was I was thinking about this early church where you have Saul, who is a Jew. He's a Pharisee, but he's also a Roman citizen from his father. And um, once the church moved out, obviously under direct persecution of Saul, um, the people just continued on. What would cause them to continue their preaching? Call it the power of the Holy Spirit. There you go. And that happened after that a magnificent event on the day of Pentecost. So no matter where... Or 40 where, days after Pentecost, rather. So no matter where God leads, the people <laughs> who have truly been <coughs> imbued, I don't know what to say, who have had the Holy Spirit take over their lives and their their vision of what God and they wants submitted them to, do. to the Holy Spirit yeah. and to Jesus fully. And see that they're in They lies, can't stop preaching. Therein lies probably the greatest challenge that we face individually is submission. We don't want to give control because we as you mentioned earlier in the lesson, it's frightening. Well, because you may have to go some other place that's yeah. not comfortable. And it's it what if he asks you to continually change? You know, a few years here, a few years there, do this, do that. And it's like, wait, wait, God, I really like this place. Or, you know, I'm glad to be leaving that place. But always God continues to call. And when he does that, the believers were um, dispersed. Now, Lebanon is north up toward above Syria. And that was called Phoenicia. And Cyprus, of course, an island. And we look at some of the areas where, you know, today we have Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan, and some of those other countries. But it was north of what we call South, South um, West Asia. And if you went a little further east, you get into what we call in the Western world, um, Iran, Iraq and Iran, and but all of that was known as Persia. And of course, you know, all of this land was was well known, but had really experienced um, how do I say? Had really experienced Islam and the persecution and the power struggle that would go on back and forth um, between these groups. So Paul, obviously, a changed man, uh, my little uh, nephew, great nephew, um, has discovered the story of Paul. He loved Pharaoh, let my people go. No, he would say. And now he's into um, Paul, Saul, Falling off his horse. Which he probably didn't have, but anyway. Well, 
I don't know. But it makes he a great story for him. Down, but yeah, anyway. but he falls off his little rocking horse, <laughs> and his dad says, Why are you persecuting me? And he goes around and pretends to be blind and say, Okay, understand yeah. he's only two, three. Yeah, but so it's a great a, story. A small child still. But when we look at that, that part of the story, Paul begins to embrace as much as he had his wicked persecution of the Christians, he now has put his zealot heart into Christianity and spreading the word of God's amazing power and grace for all sinners. And Paul, um, I was interested in, in the fact that Peter, Peter really didn't want to go and preach to anybody but Oh, he was working in Jerusalem. Yeah. And that was his... his um, That's what he thought his mission was. Yeah. His and message was I'm not, to I'm to not the, going to those Gentiles. No. I'm just going to stay here. <clears throat> however... However... God had other plans for him. And we have the recorded... <clears throat> excuse me, the recorded story of, of Peter being in Joppa and having a dream about all these unclean foods and he's supposed to eat from them and so forth and whatnot. And finally, you know the story, it was the dream three or four times and then people came to ask for him and he realized he was being called to go witness, take his message, be an apostle, a messenger to the Gentiles. And when that happened, he said, oh, okay. He willingly consented, had a change of heart, moved out of his comfort zone there with the Jews, and went beyond with his, for lack of a better word, evangelistic campaign to bring Christianity to non-Jews. Yeah. Now, that that dream, when I was young, I thought it was a dream about vegetarianism. She was very young at the time. Um, well, I was, and I was rather naive about um, some of this stuff. But I do want you to look at Acts 10, if you will go back to Acts for just a minute, and look at 10, and we're going to look at nine, verse 9 through 15. Acts 10. Acts 11 is really long, but um, Acts 10... 9 through um, 15, and 15. then 20 and 28. Or 28 and 29, rather. Um, it does Peter's vision. And I was thinking about if somebody went into a vision today, it says that he kind of fell into a trance. And that's how he um, went through the dream. I was thinking about Ellen White and how she would go into a vision And, you know, people around her could move and talk, but she was in this vision. And I don't know that I've heard of many people talking about, oh, I had a vision of, you know, we have a vision for what we want, but the vision from God that had been sent down. And so as I was looking out at that, if you go to verse 28 and 9. Still in Acts 10. Yeah. It does this. Um, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection, and then I asked then why you sent for me. And then we go to... So Peter had a total change of heart here, yeah. knowing that God was telling him something different. We This is a changed Peter from... I'll defend you to the end, and here's my sword. I'll whack off the servant's head and miss and got his ear. You know, I'll defend you to the end and denied him three times, but Peter's a different person. Oh, God, that's, oh, here I am, Lord, send me, almost. Well, and he finally gets it. If the dream, that is. Uh, that the 34. Yes. 
Truly, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the word which was sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace by Jesus Christ. The word which was proclaimed throughout Judea, um, beginning in Galilee after the baptism. Anyway, he goes through the life of Christ. Um, But then he said, he commanded us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And, of course, the Holy Spirit fell on all the people, all the believers, and um, they all were changed. Um, There wasn't one that was left unchanged, because when the power of the Holy Spirit moves, it is all-consuming. Thursday's lesson reorients us to start at home, as we've talked about from the beginning of this lesson study. Starting from where you are, that's where you're comfortable. That's where you you know people. That's where you have established your home, perhaps. Um, and that was the beginning, too, in as recorded in Acts 1, as we read earlier today. First in Jerusalem, then to Samaria, excuse me, then to Judea, then to Samaria, then to all the world. You know, first, we're right where we are, you know. Um, And God has placed us where we are for a reason. Sometimes it's hard to figure that reason out. And that might not come for years, but there is that reason. I liked, just above that, when we look at the idea of sharing truth. And it says it's not about convincing others how wrong they are Mm -hmm. or how sinful they are, but about sharing Jesus as portrayed in the three angels' message of Revelation. I, I thought about that. And what is more compelling, you know, having somebody say, this is what you're not doing. <laughs> you know, when somebody gives us constructive criticism, it isn't about all the things we did wrong. It's about, you know... This is this is who Jesus is. And when you see Jesus, all other stuff kind of fades into oblivion because it is not is not what is going to call people of every culture. I think that's the thing. Um, I'm doing India with my students right now in ancient cultures. And um, we were talking about... Um, you know, the the idea of what is more compelling in a religion. Is it the dogma or is it Jesus who can reach everybody in every culture? The dogma is our culture. The dogma is what we what we know. But if I am in a country where I've been taught that, you know, um you know, there are all these gods and these spirit gods and I, I'll be reincarnated and my whole life is set up in a, a system that blends culture and religion so tightly that they can't be separated. You would ask me not only to give up my culture but my my religion when in fact I can just present Jesus and the rest will fade away. Well, and, and part of that is when we impose what we feel is correct, people will not be attracted. You know, what did Jesus say? If I am lifted up, not if you lift up the seven, uh, 27 beliefs of sense the Adventism, all men will come to you. And I'm just 28, 26, 27, 20, 28. 28 yeah. Well, whatever the 20 is, whatever the, I think they split whatever the score is, plus, that's not what does it. It's Jesus. Yeah. You know, I worked with a man once who had studied to become an Adventist. This is many, many, many years ago, even in his studying time before I I knew him. And when it came time for baptism, the pastor said, okay, before I can baptize you, you need to give up your cigarettes. 
Well, when I knew him many years after that event, he still was smoking and he was never baptized because dogma was presented as opposed to a relational experience with Jesus. Yeah. But you can't teach a relation. You only can present what's good, what God has done for you and is doing with and for you and, and through you. And what God you. wants to do. And that will draw. Sometimes that will draw you out to other areas. Now, not everyone is called to go out and abroad, but when you are called, often you'll be called out of your comfort zone because that's where God needs you most, and He knows. He knows. And when the um, call comes to go out, those who are truly called. We'll go willingly. It won't be the Jonah yeah. thing. It won't be the... Who else didn't go with, with, with God? And then it's like, hey, no, here's the deal. Well, well, well Jonah. Well, I sent him yeah. already. And also when Elijah ran from Jezebel, and God said, no, 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 look, I got people back. You, let's get going to where you need to go. He's, as, as we would say today, he's got our back. You know, yeah. God does provide when you are truly called and are following his plan. Well, and that great commission, we hear over and over, and it was the last commission that God, that Jesus gave to his disciples. But that that is given to us each and every day. And being willing to say, God, what do you have for me today? That question is the question we have to ask every day. What is it you want from me today? Is there someone I need to touch? Is there someone? And I know that, you know, I have a tremendous list, and it's impossible to pray for everybody that has asked me to pray for them. But I know that when I need to pray, God calls that person up to me throughout the day. It can be in the middle of the day. It can be even late at night. There are times where I'm, I wake up and I have a person on my mind and I can't go back to sleep and I'll pray and pray and finally I get to go back to sleep. I don't know why I prayed for that person, but God does. And God, God can use us in so many ways. And he doesn't always ask us to go far away from our home. Um, one of my... Um, former students right now um, is working with people from Australia um, is, he who have a, come, is he or she no, in Australia? No, who have come to America ah. to be missionaries There you go And it's so funny when you think about it Well, not really People from Australia are coming here because they're missionaries and we go other places to well, be missionaries but I just, I, it, to me, it's kind of um, an interesting perspective because we think about America and we're going out to bless the world. But that's not what God is asking us to do. He is asking us to be a blessing and when he calls us to respond. And that's that's what we're looking at through these next few lessons. Let's bow our heads. Oh, through your spirit and through the life of Christ, we get such a beautiful picture of God. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for that. We thank you that you had a plan. We thank you that you have given us opportunity to be a part of your mission. And that mission is to restore us. To be whole. To be your witnesses through eternity. We pray that we will open our hearts and we will be willing we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. See what mission God might have for you open to him. And that can be quite an adventure. See you next time.